שלום חברים, עשה שלום, אבל זה אין שלום. I say peace, my friends, but there is no peace. And, um, but anyway, let's go right into this video here. Um, the title of the video, Shimon Perez Matches Bible Prophecy, is maybe a little bit, um, it's not the heart of the message, but the thing is, is I want to bring out to you more so about the two witnesses and the things that are taking place on the earth today what God will do, um, and yet to try to straighten out all the false doctrines that are going on about the two witnesses. Now, in some respect, we might say that the two witnesses and the identity of the two witnesses does not really matter. And no doubt, as far as for the salvation purposes, it does not matter. But then again, if we look at the fact of all kinds of doctrines that go on that are not of God, uh, I, I suppose then it does become an issue. And um, I remember when I did a video a little while back about challenging the people about uh, the spirit of Elijah that would come. I had a lot of uh, different thoughts that were thrown towards me there, some that I'm aware of, some um, I had not heard before, but one in particular that kind of caught my attention was a man did a video and the, um, uh, the brother will say uh, that did this video here, he was respectful in the way he, uh, he approached it, but he challenged me in saying that uh, when it come right down to it, that, he, that, that John the Baptist had fulfilled these scriptures uh, about uh, the coming of Elijah for a future event. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to address uh, in, a, in a roundabout way throughout this video th his comments there saying that John the Baptist had fulfilled that will be addressed. Uh, but there is hundreds and hundreds of uh, opinions that have, that have come on the video with Chuck Missler. Uh, and I'm hoping that the people that have watched have been like 80,000 or so or maybe 90,000 views on this video. Um, about the two witnesses. I'm hoping that those that have made those comments that somehow or another that they will actually be able to see this video here and maybe it will help put things in their proper perspective. And, um, and we have to realize, many of us do, that history repeats itself and this is what we're, we're looking at. Um, now the one person that did, that did the video criticizing what I had said uh, use the word incarnation uh, in no I do not believe in reincarnation uh, but let's let's just say this real quick here before we get into the whole subject here that when the scripture says about Elisha when the prophets in Jericho saw Elijah Elisha coming back and he put the mantle on the river Jordan and the waters did part they said does not the spirit of Elijah rest upon Elisha now, when we say the spirit of Elijah, what really is the spirit of Elijah? It's the Holy Spirit that was anointing Elijah to do the things that he did. And so, therefore, what really is it? It's not that Elijah has incarnated Elisha, but rather it's the same spirit of God, the Ruach ha ha HaKadosh, that has come upon Elisha to do the things that Elisha, Elijah did when he was here on earth. Same thing with John the Baptist. When, uh, when the spirit of Elijah come upon him, it was not the spirit of Elijah per se, but the spirit, the Holy Ghost, the spirit of God himself that was upon him, the same maybe portion of spirit of the Holy Spirit that was upon Elijah that made him act the way he did came upon John the Baptist. Now we're gonna get into all that. But let's go though, the reason for the title though, I want to take you back, and I think you're going to find some things that are going to shock you, but let's deal with the title of the video. Ahab, or excuse me, Shimon Perez um, uh, matches Bible prophecy. Interesting video, or, uh, or title, I should say. But uh, let's take a look at the reason why I chose this title here. Uh, and, and maybe I haven't actually done the title as, a, as you see me speaking here, so I might tweak that a little bit uh, and put on there Ahab. Uh, 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 fulfilling uh, biblical prophecies. Um, but anyway, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 21. Let's begin right there. 
Uh, Behold, I will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy posterity and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of uh, Ahiah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city of the dog shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in the following idols, according to all things, as did the Amorites whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, and that's Eliyahu for my Jewish brothers, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me, because he humbleth himself before me? I will not bring the evil in, the, in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. Shimon Perez, you are that son of Ahab fulfilling the biblical prophecy that is written here in 1 Kings chapter 21 and i know that's a hard thing to say but we're going to get into the two witnesses we're going to understand what they come for who they are and why they come um let's quickly i want to show you because you are on the door right at the very door of tribulation itself and i want to show you something that by God's grace, I believe he showed me, that lets you know the hour that you're living in. And let's take and go to chapter 16 in the first Kings, and just look at this right here. Let's begin with uh, verse 30. This is where Ahab, God is in, in verse uh, chapter 16, God goes to the lineage here of the kings and the evil that is going on in Israel from the time uh, of Solomon's passing and, and how the different ones have taken over and the, and, the, and the conflicts. But we get into here to verse 30. It's when it speaks about Ahab and says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of, uh, of the Z uh, Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him, and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. In his days... Did Chael the Bethelite build Jericho? He laid the foundation thereof in Ibram, his firstborn. In other words, his firstborn died as a result of the prophecy of uh, Yahshua uh, ben Nun. But anyway, it says, uh, And Abram his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof, and the youngest son, uh, Sigub, according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by Joshua the son of Nun. Now, before I read the next verse, keep in mind what he's doing here or, or, or what this is saying, or just so you know the, little, the, the, the thing about uh, uh, Jericho. Uh, Joshua had said when the city was destroyed, cursed be the man and his firstborn who builds back this city. And so it's kind of ironic that they were foolish enough to lay the walls and foundations again, but they did it anyway. Notice, though, verse 7, chapter 17, verse 1, what happens next. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was, in, was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And tribulation set in in those days upon Israel 
Why? What for? Because Ahab had married Jezebel and brought idolatry into Israel. This is exactly what Shimon Perez is doing as a son of Ahab. He has gone to the Vatican to marry up with Jezebel and to bring idolatry into Israel. Now, interestingly enough, for those of you that don't know this, Jezebel, you know, she's the daughter of Ethbel, uh, uh, the king of the Zidonians. Historically speaking, they worship the sun god and also a goddess. I forget the name of that goddess. God forgive me. I should have meant to write that down, but I forgot to. But just look it up and everything, the Zidonians. If you look up the Zidonians, you'll find out that they worship a goddess and, of course, the sun god. And uh, many of you know that that is also the way the Vatican does. They, they make Mary their goddess. And, of course, they do the sun god worship as well. And I know I mentioned about the moon god. Well, one day, I'll, by God's grace, I'll try to get in here and separate the two of those so you understand what that's about. But, the, but what is this? God brings judgment upon the earth here as a result of what Ahab did. And that was to marry Jezebel. Uh, and then we're going to get into this as we go here. Now, let's kind of set the stage here. Um, let's go then to the Christian text of um, Revelation 11, because we're going to talk about the two witnesses, and we want to understand who they are, and then we're going to get into the identity of the two witnesses. Um, and also, too, by the way, as I get into this, I do want to share with you something. There is, uh, I, I do not recall his name, but on my Facebook page, there is a, a man that uh, posted an article there about, um, um, he had said, and maybe, no, I won't be able to do it in this video here, uh, maybe if I can remember to post uh, his name on there, or at least the article, you could see that. Uh, this man, uh, actually at one time, he stood for Israel as being born a nation, and then he said after two or three years of Torah study, uh, he has had, since then had a change of mind that Israel being born in 1948 is actually not uh, of God. And in the process of this video here, and I will actually post this video as part of the comment place in, 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 the, in the box there for his comments. There have been many, many, many people commented, many people in support of his theory. Uh, and, and here's the concern that I have when we look at this here um, with, with him being against Israel being a nation now. You have to understand the secular nation of Israel is in place in order to be an umbrella, so to speak, for the remnant of Israel that is there. Uh, I would say also the building of the third temple that will be, that will be spearheaded by the Vatican, uh, I am not for that. That is true. I'm not for that. Plainly, God speaks about a third temple coming down out of heaven. Uh, we know that. But nonetheless, God also says in his word that he would gather Israel from all the nations, whether he has scattered them, and bring them back into their homeland. Now, we're there now as a nation. He said we would dwell there as, an, as a people with, with a city without walls. Uh, because there's so many there, and truly uh, Israel is fulfilling that as well. He said both the house of Israel and the house of Judah would dwell again once in safety. Uh, and these prophecies are made when the house of Israel had already been scattered for, for quite, a, quite a number of years. Uh, so we are there in our homeland, but he uses a lot of the scriptures to talk about how that the peace would come and, you know, uh, you know because of Moshiach coming. You can't misplace scripture, and that's what's happened in, in, in the where this brother has gone to. But my concern for him, and for those that believe in such nonsense here, is that you're borderlining blasphemy. Because blasphemy is to call the works of God an unclean thing. So for God to gather the children of Israel back into their homeland, and for you to say that that is not of God, you are calling the very work of Almighty God unclean. And that, my friend, is blasphemy. So the seriousness of, uh, of the accusations there is just, is just tremendous. Anyway, let's get into the two witnesses. 
And there was given me, uh, chapter Revelation chapter 11, there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of uh, of the earth and if, if if any man will hurt them fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies and if any man will hurt them he must in this manner be killed these have power to shut heavens that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, which also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people of the kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there an earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Now, my friends, Let's settle a couple of issues real quick just from the very reading of Revelation chapter 11 right here, at least the verses uh, 1 to verse 14 here. One, their dead bodies, they're killed and their dead bodies lay in that street there and it's kind of interesting, they call it Sodom and Egypt because it is an ungodly area right outside the Damascus Gate in Jerusalem there and also because it is a Palestinian area, so it is like a modern-day Egypt. It is a Muslim-controlled area, or, or an Arabic-controlled area, we might say there. Um, but they're killed. They are men. They die. They lay in the street. They are raised up from the dead. The remnant, which is the 144,000, they are, are, are fearful, but yet, at the same time, we see that... Um, um, Let's look at that one more time real quick. And, uh, uh, but they give glory to the, to the God of heaven. Why? Because redemption for them is soon at hand. Now, also we see that fire proceeds from their mouth, kills their enemies. Uh, it rains not in the days of their ministry. Now, both of those there are part of Elijah's ministry. It's the way he dealt. Remember the 50 soldiers that came down and he said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and, and, and destroy you. And uh, and, and that happened twice, and on the third time that, it, that the, that the uh, captain that came down, he had a little bit more respect and recognized that this was truly a man of God. And uh, uh, also the closing of, of, the, of the heavens. Now remember, why does that happen? Notice this here, friends. Notice this carefully. When I read to you over here about Ahab marrying Jezebel, bringing idolatry into Israel in 1 Kings, then immediately Elijah comes on the scene and as a result of that marriage, that covenant that Ahab made, God closes up the heavens and it doesn't rain. Now here we have right here, immediately at the time, as we see there's, there's a temple that's being built. They're measuring it. They're leaving out the outer court because it's given to the Gentiles. Why, why is it given to the Gentiles? What, what did Ahab do? He built the groves. He built an altar for Baal. And here we have Shimon Perez just went to the Vatican here, what, a month ago? And making all these concessions with the Vatican, marrying, he's courting Jezebel. But when the hour comes that he marries Jezebel, they'll begin the building of the third temple. And the Gentiles will be given... 
the outer court. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. That's Jezebel. She'll be given a place just as Ahab built an altar for Baal. My God, people, do you ever, do you ever realize when you, when you say the name Baal or Baalim? It's husbands. I mean, it's in other words, you know, I mean, if you, if a Baal, where's your husband? In modern Hebrew, that's the, the term used. But in this case here, it's husbands. Why? Because they have more than one God. Not satisfied with, with uh, Shema Yisrael Adonai Leheinu Adonai Hechad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. And for the Jewish people, you're not going to give us two gods, and you're not going to give us three gods. We're not going to take it. But the thing is, then, me, Yeshua, who is Jesus? Yeshua, who Elohim? Did not John say in the... When, uh, in, you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Not like the Watchtower people say, uh, well, you know, there is a definite article that's there, and uh, that is, uh, he is a God. There's no such thing in the Greek language. And yet they come and they knock on your door and you believe such nonsense? Don't believe their lies! They make two gods out of it. And a good Trinitarian believer knows that there's one God, but he manifests himself in more than one way. Jews know that. We know that God came down and manifested himself before Moses. We also know that he actually was showed his, the backside of a man, and yet the word of God tells us that he's invisible. A spirit which cannot be seen. So what was the revelation that John had? John saw, he says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. What was the Word? The first Word that come out of Almighty God's mouth, the Yomad Elohim Yahior. God making, make, making Himself materialized as the light in the dimension that we live in in order to be able to have fellowship with us. And I have to ask you, who is the tree of life? We kind of get off on that, but I, I really don't want to get off on that. Let, let, me, let me kind of stay focused with you here. So we have these two witnesses and the other one turns the water to blood. Now, clearly, John identifies the two witnesses as the two olive trees. He's speaking back in Zechariah, which are the two anointed ones, because we know what Zechariah says about that. You know, they're the two anointed ones. Son of man, you know, what are, you know, yes, what be these two, uh, uh, these two candlesticks? And the angel said, these are the anointed one to stand before the presence of the Lord, see? So they come. Now John's identifying who they are and what they're doing and why, when they're coming. They're coming at a time when the temple is going to be built. And according to um, in, in 1 Kings, we also find Elijah comes on the scene when Ahab marries Jezebel. So there has to be a marriage with Jezebel, and Jezebel is nothing more or nothing less than a type of the Vatican. What, what, what does the revelation say about the great whore? It says she has daughters. They make an image into the beast. Who can make war with her? And the churches have done so. They've made an image into the beast. You know? Friends, I mean, this is very deep. It's very deep, no doubt about it. But I know that there is many that believe that Enoch is, is, the, um, is one of the two witnesses. They'll say Elijah and Enoch. Let, let's look at that, though. One, we don't see Enoch never had this. No, there's no scripture that records that Enoch had th these gifts here. Um, I know that uh, Chuck made the comment. He said, well, Enoch's not Jewish. And God's going to send his own to him. And I agree with that. 
But Enoch, my friend, is a type of the raptured bride of Christ. So if he comes back and dies, you take away that type. Now, what I find fascinating, and there's so many people, there's literally hundreds of comments on the video with Chuck Messler that, that were me and him. We actually were talking about the Sea of Reeds, but we get into that subject about the two witnesses that are coming. And many of the people on there, their argument over and over and over is it has to be Enoch because Enoch did not die. Elijah did not die, and they have to come back because the Bible says it's appointed a man once to die. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I have gone back into there to look at that appointed. It does not mean that you absolutely, if you haven't died, you're going to have to come back and die. Here's why I say that. Do you realize how many people that hold that doctrine and believe that based on that scripture also believe in a pre-tribulation rapture? And quoting the very scripture where Paul says, we shall not all sleep, but the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which have remained alive shall be caught up together with them. You know, what is that? First Thessalonians, I believe, something like that. They believe in... It's fascinating. They believe in the rapture of the bride. So when then does the bride have to come back and die? If you're going to take and say that Enoch has to be one of the two witnesses because it's appointed a man who wants to die and he absolutely has to come back and die, then the bride then has to come back and die as well. When? Now this is for all of you that hold the idea that it has to be Enoch because of that scripture. See, see You see where you kind of get yourself at? You get yourself into a situation that doesn't match the Word of God. Enoch is a type of the raptured saints. Noah is a type of the tribulation saints. Noah is a type of the church that goes into tribulation. So if Enoch types the raptured saints, then how can we sit there and say that he has to die? So, and secondly, it doesn't match the Word of God. Now, because we're dealing with the issue of of Moses or Enoch. Let, let me just share with you. Gosh. All right. Can't read it to you just from Hebrews. So let me let me let me take you to um, Exodus, and let's take a look at. Um, let's go to Shemot Exodus uh, chapter. I believe it's chapter three. And. Um, Okay, and uh, I, I want to go down to the signs themselves. I, actually, actually, there's one thing I do want to point out to you real quick. Chapter 3, verse 13, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, uh, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. They shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Now, I do want to take for my Jewish brethren, I want to read that. Uh, I, I kind of stop on that just for a moment here, and the reason I do is because there is a lot of debate about God's name, and of course, people that try to say uh, Jehovah, and forgive me my Jewish brothers as I say these things, uh, they say that, well, that name's incorrect. Well, of course it's incorrect. Uh, we put the vowels from Adonai in yod heh vav -Hey in Hebrew to try to keep from saying something that we should not say because the God's word says, take not the Lord thy God's name in vain. Well, then the Christians come up with, um, with the idea that, well, uh, Yahweh, now we have the correct pronunciation of the name of God. No, you don't. No, you don't. You still don't. Um, and, and it's sad to say that to you. I hate to say that to you, but the reason why I say that is because if you can pronounce that divine name of God, that's powerful. It's like when you say Yahshua, when you say the, his name, he said, in my name they shall cast out devils, they shall raise the dead, they shall speak with new tongues. You know, we, we know these passages here. I'm a witness of that myself. At the very name of Yeshua, Jesus, and for those of you that debate that idea too, I, I agree. I mean, if you know his name to say Yeshua, say Yeshua. But even there's debate over how to pronounce that. Is it Yeshua? Yahshua? 
just all kinds of crazy things out there. But yet I'll tell you this, in the name of Jesus himself, at his name, I've seen the blinded eyes open and I've seen the dead raised at that name. And I believe God gave that because one, he brought salvation through Yeshua and which means Jehovah is salvation. So doesn't mean Jehovah will send salvation or anything like that. It means Jehovah is salvation. So there again, it identifies who he was when he came. But let me just bring this out again. I think, what was that, verse 12 where you read from? Uh, in the Christian Bible, I think it's verse 12. Uh, in the Hebrew, a little different. Uh, no, I think it's still the same thing. Yes. Ve'yomer Moshe el Elohim hine anochi ba'el b'nei Yisrael ve'amati lahem Elohai avotechem shelachani elayachem ve'amuli they will say to me Mashimo what is his name ma'omel elachem what do I say to them that is going to repeat itself. And Moses <clears throat> is about the only guy that will be able to tell him that. Of course, Elijah knew the name of uh, Hashem as well. Uh, so he will know that as, as well. But anyway, so he says that. What, what should be the name? But anyway, I want to get back, though. There's a more important verse here I'm trying to bring you to. Uh, and this is when God gives him the signs that he gives him. Um... Let me just find that for you real quick here. Uh, we know that, let's see, and I will give this people favor in this. Okay, behold. Uh, okay, it's actually in chapter 4. And we're going to go to verse 7. And he said, put thine hand into thy bosom. And again, he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out in the bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Now, I have said this to you guys on videos before. Think about what he's saying here. Now, let me read this real quick for my Jewish brethren. Uh, chapter 4, verse 8. Uh, Shemot. Um, bear with me just a moment here, please. Dalet. And uh, go to verse 8. Vahaya imlo yamenu lecha velo yashmu lekol haot. Okay? If they don't, see, notice what he says there. Yamenu lecha velo yishma. Ishmu, excuse me, Ishmu, le haot. If they don't believe the voice of the first sign, Harishon, le kol haot Harishon, which is the voice of the first sign, ve hamenu le kol haot haachron. They shall believe the voice of the latter sign. Do you realize that Moses' voice itself, he was the voice of God to the Jews of that day. And he was assigned to them because what he said come to pass. And it seems odd for God himself to say, if they don't believe the voice of the first sign, in other words, if they don't believe your voice when you come the first time, they shall believe your voice when you come at a latter time. And then we wonder why we have here the two witnesses. And, and this has nothing to do when, when, when uh, Yeshua meets, takes up uh, the three witnesses and they meet with Elijah and Moshe, Eliyahuve Moshe, on a high mountain. And by the way, I do kind of question whether or not that mountain really was in Israel. I have to, I'll, I'll talk about that another time, but I, I kind of wonder if they didn't go up to Mount Sinai because Jesus said he led them up. Do you realize, I don't know if you guys know this also, let me just kind of say this. Elijah, when he was here, he was a very interesting guy. Do you realize that Elijah on a regular basis supernaturally was hid by God? He literally would move from one place to another, so to speak, kind of be like, Let's say you were in Florida, in, in Miami, and you moved you from Miami to Tampa without taking you by car, and you was there at the blink of an eye. 
like the story of Philip. Philip goes and he preaches to the Ethiopian eunuch, and then the next thing you know, about 30, 40 miles away, he ends up at the coast, uh, coastline over there uh, just uh, south of Tel Aviv. And then, you know, he's caught away in the spirit. Well, Elijah, this was normal. And how do we know this? Because Obadiah, when Obadiah runs into Elijah in the street, he's so fearful, he says, go get the king Ahab and bring him here. And he says to him, kind of paraphrase it, he says, well, you know, I do, what have I done wrong? Because if I go get him, you won't be here. Because every time the king has sent for you, all over, the, all over, everywhere, no place has he not looked and can't find you. Because God takes you out. He's always hiding you. Go from one place to another. Look at when Ahab was coming down in his chariot. Elijah just girds up his clothes and he's ahead of him. Runs ahead of him. How does he, how, how does he outrun the chariot? Interesting, just interesting thoughts here for you to think about here. But anyway, so I forget where I left off at, but let's continue on. Moses, though, he is that sign. Oh, I know what it was. Let's go to Exodus chapter 15. And there again, you know, you guys, you've seen me talk about these bits and pieces here. Um, and I have never fully put it all together for you. But it says, then saying Moses... Uh, and the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord spake, saying, See, now here it is, personal pronoun. I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Now, horse and his rider. There were 600 that came down in that day when Moses was on the seaside. This has already happened, but Moses sings about one horse and one rider. Now, let me go into the Hebrew for you. Just this for my, again... Um, uh, Achim Achim Shali, my, my, my brothers, uh, the Yudim, the Jewish brothers there. Let's look at that 15. Now, you know, the Jewish brothers, we know, we know already. I mean, Rashi brought this out to us uh, in the Midrash that. Moses, because he says, "As Yeshua Moshe, Uven Yisrael et Hashira," you know, and, and they would sing, and, and, and Moses sings with the children of Israel at uh, this song, "Hazot Ladonai veYamu Lemor," saying, "See, Ashira, personal pronoun again, Ashira." I will sing in the future. Ashira, let me get, gotta get back. I lost my place here. Ashira, Ladona, Kiga, Aga, O, Sus, Verekavo, Ramabeyom. One horse and one rider is cast into the sea. It's the Antichrist spirit. Moses comes back. He sings the song of redemption. It, does, does the scripture not say in the Christian Bible the 144,000 they sing this song? that no one can learn but them? Why? Because Moses and Elijah come back and Moses teaches them the song of redemption and they sing the song. What? Friends, Revelation 15, it, it kind of conjunctions with this. I'll just share this with you. It's, it's just fascinating. And even for uh, my Jewish brothers, this is really interesting. You know, so many years we look at the Christian Bible as, oh, don't read it, it's got all kinds of mistakes. It's dovetails perfectly with our Torah and, and the Tanakh. Um, Revelation chapter 15, verse 1, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. Judgment is about to strike. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name and stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? They sing the song of Moses. How'd they learn it? He came back. But notice Moses is not with them. Because why? One of the two witnesses, he dies. Marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true. They sing, excuse me, they sing the song of, uh, 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 excuse me, they, 
Let me back that up. I forgot to tell you the whole thing. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, so they recognize who Moshiach is at that time. So th the point is, is we have scriptural evidence written plainly in the Torah that shows that Moses will return. God says to him, if they don't believe the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. Actually, yeah, of the latter sign. That would be correct in, in the translation. They will believe the, the sign that comes afterwards, the voice of the sign. So Moses has to return because the children of Israel never really believed Israel in that time. God wiped out everybody except Caleb and Joshua out of the original ones. He wiped them all out. Where was the faith? It, it, it wasn't there. Now, here, here comes the debate, though, and uh, I believe it's... What do I have down here? This is where the one person that did the video that debated who the Elijah of... Uh, you know, as far as he, he, he debated the idea that I, that I said, I challenged the idea, where has Elijah come and restored all things? So he takes over to Luke chapter 1 uh, in the Christian text here. Let me just read this to you. Um, I'll tell you what. Before I read Luke chapter 1, because what he's going to do, he's going to take here in his, in his argument, if you listen to the video there, he basically tries to prove that John is the, is the, um, the Elijah that, that was to, the, the Elijah of Malachi 4, quite frankly. Um, Jesus makes an interesting comment. Let me just share this with you here. And this is kind of where the debate got started there. Jesus says, uh, and I don't have the scripture marked down, but if you, I'm sure you can find it easily if you just put on, uh, well, I, I can pretty much quote it, not exactly, maybe word for word, but I can quote it. They ask him, doesn't the scripture say that Elias, that's the Greek word for Elijah, doesn't the scripture say that Elias must first come? And Jesus answers them and says, truly Elias shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you, he's come already, and they did to him whatever soever he listed. Now, people seem to miss that. Jesus puts that coming of Elijah in the future to restore all things. And, but then he speaks of John the Baptist. Now, don't forget, as I tell you this, you have to remember Isaiah 61, where Jesus comes in the temple, he picks up the scroll, and he reads... You know, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to, to preach an acceptable year, to, you know, um, let, 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 me, let me read it. I, I don't want to get into something and then you, then you lose this later. Um, in Isaiah, Yeshayahu, Shashim um, Bechad, in Isaiah 61, Jesus is actually quoting this verse right here when he reads it to the children of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, and he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now he stopped in the middle of the verse, and he put the scripture down, the scroll down, and he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Okay? or in your sight. I forget which one he says there. Now, does not the rest of the verse 2 apply to Jesus as well? Yes, but not at his first coming. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. That is a future coming of Jesus, Yeshua. That is when he returns. That is For the, for the house of Israel, that will be his first coming. For, for the Christian, the second coming. For the house of Judah, the second coming. But he comes, nonetheless. Now, so we see that it's not uncommon for him to do just part of a verse. So in Malachi, uh, for my Jewish brother that, that, that watches this video here, in the Christian Bible, they said they make a fourth chapter out of our third. It's still, though, in the third chapter of Malachi, but in the Christian Bible, it is in the fourth chapter. 
uh, because they break it up into an extra chapter. I, I, I don't know how come or why that actually happens, but they do. Um, but let's real quick take you to that. And uh, pardon me, I keep scratching. I'm sweating over here. And uh, a little warm here. Actually, it shouldn't be too warm, but it's just the heat and stuff from the lights. Um, but in Malachi, gosh, it's like so close right here, and these pages are so thin. Okay, Malachi 4. Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh that shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now that's, the, we're, we're living at the time where God is going to burn up the people. So quite frankly, John did not come during that time. Nothing happened like that right after his, his, his coming. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth as, and grow up as calves of the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, and for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded uh, unto him in Horeb for all the Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanavi, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Hmm. Now, this brother here is going to take you, though, and he's going to say that this is fulfilled in John the Baptist. It's not before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, though. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. But we're going to find that Jesus does apply part of that verse to John. Let's look at that. Luke chapter 1, and this is where he takes us to. There's one other place he takes it. Uh, don't have time to go into that one as well. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. The only part of the verse that Jesus quotes is part of the verse. And then people assume automatically the heart of the children to their fathers. Let me, let me just make sure I got that one right. Go back. No, excuse me. The heart of the fathers to, their, to the children. That's what it is. The heart of the, heart of the fathers to the children. Uh, and that's, let's see, the heart of the fathers to the children. So, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. He doesn't quote the second half of the verse, and the heart of the children to their fathers. He doesn't quote that. Why doesn't he quote the second half of the verse? Just like with Isaiah 61, verse 2. The second half of verse 2 applied to the second coming. And so it's not. It's, it's ironic, but perfectly in line with the scripture. The second half of this verse here didn't apply to the first coming of Elijah, or not in this case, first coming of Elijah, but it didn't apply to the Elijah of the day of, and it's kind of interesting, didn't apply to the day of the tribulation that struck, that was going to strike Israel in 70 AD when Titus would besiege the city. Because by the way, that was the great tribulation that Jesus spoke of, where he said the day would come a tribulation that had not been seen on the earth or never shall be thereafter. I think that's Luke 24, if I'm not mistaken. Now, there's people that, that, that have always applied when Jesus talks about that tribulation there, they apply that to a tribulation that's coming in the future. It can't be. And how do we know it can't be? Now, I don't have that in front of me. Maybe I could find it rather quickly for you. I would like to find that. Uh, but the reason why we know that that is not the tribulation that, that Jesus is speaking of, um, it's funny. I say here, I turn to Luke 24, and I see the verse right off the part here. Then he said unto them, Fool, O fools and slow of heart to believe all, that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? I think that today, especially amongst the Christian people, 
fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You know, you just, you take this one over here, you take that one over there, but you're not taking all the word of God. That's how that brother on Facebook, that's what he did. He's taken over here and he's looking at what's going to happen when Israel is, is gathered a nation. He's looking at the millennial reign. Yes, there will be peace during that time. But he's failed to see that God brings her home, not because for her sake, but for his name's sake. Jesus prayed the prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thine will be done. What did he do that for? See, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Sanctify thy name, O God. Make your name say, Jesus' prayer was to bring back Israel to her homeland. Let me just show something to you here, especially to this brother on, on, on Facebook. That, that, that has, I mean, he did believe good at one time. He believed that, yes, I would have argued with it. In 1948, there became a nation. It was the hand of God. It was the hand of God. Now, is it Zechariah's prophecy where it said they would be born in one day? No, that's when they recognized Moshiach. That's Zechariah's prophecy. But he still has to get them in their homeland because he promised that Israel will not be blessed until she's in her homeland. Jeremiah chapter 36. Let me just read some of these. Or, oh, wait a minute. Is it Jeremiah or is it Ezekiel? Hang on one second, my brothers. I, 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 and I may have the wrong chapter. Hang on. Bear with me here. I want to share with you something here. Um, let me just find that real quick. I say Jeremiah a lot of times, and I think it's actually Ezekiel. That's yes, Ezekiel 36. My apology. Ezekiel chapter 36. Moreover, the word of the Lord, verse 16, came to me saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me they were as was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. Therefore I poured out my fury on them for the blood they had shed on the land and for their idols which they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. When they came to the nations, went, uh, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet have they gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which, is, which the house of Israel has profaned among the nations, wherever they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I have hallowed, excuse me, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. God becomes hallowed. He becomes sanctified before their eyes. When? Let's find out when. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will take a heart of stone and spirit... Uh, stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. But he brings them back to the homeland to make this come to pass. It doesn't mean that the day they get there that he does this. People, you're looking at, you're, you're getting this all mixed up when you're looking at the Word of God. You think that Israel becomes a nation. It's like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They believed at one time that, 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 that when Israel became a nation that it was the hand of God. Of course, they had to change their doctrine because they sent over their people and they tried to witness to the Jews and the Jews kick them out. Oh, it can't be of God because they didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. You know what? God deals with Israel. As I've said in the other videos and everything, he, he has to have two witnesses, and they're witnesses. They're not of Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostals, or any of the other denominations. Have, have you ever wondered what um, what Malachi means by turning the hearts of the fathers to the children? 
and the let, let, let me reread that again. And 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 by the way, uh, you probably can see we're cutting in on the video here. I had to stop earlier, so I come back here this afternoon to to finish this up. And, and, and quite frankly, is I thank God that this happened because this morning when I started the video, I had really I, I saw something that just really excited my heart and then only to, to get, get, get a confirmation of this as I uh, did a little research in between the two takes here that, I, that I'm doing this in. So let's look at this again. Now this, especially for the brother that did the video uh, that was taking up a challenge on me, I, I want you to look at this right here. In Malachi, in the, in the Christian Bible, chapter 4, verse... Um, Let's, let's go to verse 4, uh, Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all the Israel and with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. What is the heart of the fathers? Who really understands the significance of what is the heart of the fathers? The heart of the fathers is the covenant in which God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what is that covenant? Thy seed shall possess this land. Now, I'm going to take you to a little place. I'm going to show you something in just a minute. But let's let's go back to where this one brother had mentioned uh, Luke uh, chapter 1. And like I said there again, I, uh, gosh, I should have gone back and looked at his uh, email to me there and looked up that other verse for him as well. But, I, I, you know, to me, clearly, you can't get around the Word of God. Once you begin to see that John the Baptist did not fulfill all of this. He did not fulfill... Everything that's written in here, just like where Jesus says, uh, truly Elias shall first come and restore all things. But I say to you, he's already come, and they did so whatever he listed. And as I mentioned to you already, John was dead. John the Baptist was dead when Jesus said that, but he put a coming of Elijah in the future. And again, I'll repeat it. I do not believe in reincarnation. As I said, is it going to be the literal Moses and Elijah? It very well could be. Very well could be. I tend to lean more towards two men anointed with that spirit. And the reason I do is because um, we see in the scripture when, it, when Eli uh, uh, Elisha received that spirit, it was, they said, does not the spirit of, of Elijah rest upon Elisha? When John the Baptist came in the power of uh, the spirit of Elijah, they understood that Jesus was speaking of John the Baptist, when he spoke of, uh, he actually quotes part of Malachi chapter 4 right here. And, uh, and but we find that as that one brother quoted here, Luke chapter 1 and verse 15. Uh, I believe it's actually verse 16, but let me just look at it real quick. Um, he says here, uh, and he went and joined himself no, excuse me, I'm in the wrong chapter here. Uh, that's chapter 15. I mean to go chapter 1 of Luke. And, um, and what does he say here? Verse 15 here. Uh, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, speaking of John, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, which is Elijah. Now he's going to quote the verse. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and, uh, uh, excuse me, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And he stops. He doesn't quote the second half of Malachi, where Malachi says, uh, Malachi says that too, you know, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. But then he stops, and the heart of the children to their fathers. The heart of God in the fathers is the covenant that he made with Abraham. So when he turns the heart of the fathers 
to the children, what's he doing? He's turning the covenant that he made with Abraham to the children. He sent Moshiach. Moshiach is that covenant being fulfilled, turned the covenant that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thy seed, every time he keeps talking about the seed, the seed is Moshiach. And he turns the seed to the children. And see, that's why you can only, that's why only part of the verse is fulfilled because Christ, when he came, he fulfilled that first part. Not the heart of the children, back to the fathers. What, he's ta what is he talking about? Back to the fathers. Back to the covenant. In the latter days, they recognized Moshiach and who he was, and they recognized that the covenant had been fulfilled, and now in the latter days, they begin to recognize what's going on, and they finally get it. In this point, Elijah is pointing them back to the covenant that's been fulfilled. Now do you understand what he means in Malachi 4 here? The heart of the fathers, the very heart. What is it? They all long for that day that Moshiach would come, that the seed would be here. Doesn't the scripture say that the prophets and the sages, they long to see this day that you live in, or the day that they were living in then? They were looking for that time because Malachi had prophesied of it. Now, just to show you what I'm telling you is true, turn to Deuteronomy and go to chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 30, I believe is where that's at. Now again, you're going to find another verse, and you've got to be careful with this, because it's a two-fold part here. When he said, let me back up to say verse 28, and there, and, and there ye shall serve, well let me back up a little further, let's go to verse uh, 26. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land, whereunto you go over Jordan to possess it. And you shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall surely, oh, excuse me, shall utterly be destroyed. Now he's not talking about when, when Israel would be taken down into uh, Babylon. But he's talking about when Titus would come in and besiege the city. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. See, not just one, not just Babylon. Nations, plural. And you shall be left few in number among the heathen, whether the Lord shall lead you. Few in number. Because why? The Jews have been killed all the way down through time. And there you shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But if from thence, in other words, from there, thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, Thou shalt find him. And if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul, when thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, notice that's two different times. That's even, even that very verse is two different time frames. Gosh. There, there's your Luke 20, or excuse me, uh, Matthew chapter 24. When Jesus speaks about the tribulation, never was on the face of the earth, or never shall be thereafter. Israel went through that tribulation then, when Titus besieged the city. But as you go down, we find out later, after the immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall not give her light. You know, people. You got to recognize the hour you're living in, and and, and 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 rightly divide the word of God. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the see, even in the latter days. See there. Let, let me let me get this for you in Hebrews, so, so maybe you can understand better. You know. I didn't read it right there to start with, but let me. I need to read that because maybe that'll help you to better understand. I can only imagine uh, the 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 verse that is used here. 
in Hebrew are the words that Moses must, uh, must have written on this subject. Um, okay, verse 30 here. If you search for him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Okay, let's 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 back up here. Let me just see here. Okay. Okay, hang on one second here. I want to find just here. Uh, there you will serve gods, the handiwork of men and wood and stone, which do not see, neither hear, nor uh, and do not eat and do not smell. From there you will seek. Hashem, your God, and you will find him. If you search for him with all your heart and all your soul, when you are in distress and all these things have befallen you, at the end of the days you will return unto Hashem, your God, and hearken to his voice. Now, that's very important here. Uh, let me just real quick here find this over in Hebrew for you. Okay, Misham, from there... At Hashem Elochayach, who masat ki to the to the to the shenu beko lavech lav excuse me lavechach who excuse me beko who who nifshach with all of your soul. I'm, I'm looking for one particular thing in Hebrew here, and I'm just trying to see if this is in here that I'm looking at here. The, the point that I'm trying to get you to see here is that it's a, there's a separation in time here. And um, maybe it's, let me just catch this back for you again. When thou art in, in tribulation, okay, in verse 30 here, um, Okay, and, and all these things. There we go. Ad, okay, Ad Hashem Alecha Ushamat Bekolo. My gosh. What, what did I tell you that, that, that God said to Moses when he spoke to him and he said, if they do not believe the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. They would believe Moses when he returned again. I'll go back to King James for the Christian people's sake here so you can understand this a little bit better here. Um, but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, and thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul, when thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days. See, when you're in tribulation and these things come upon you. That tribulation was during the time of Titus. But notice, he says, even in the latter days. The latter days and the tribulation are not the same right here. If thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice. What did God say to Moses? If they don't believe the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. And here again, we have right here, if, but even in the latter days, if thou shalt turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice. For the Lord thy God is merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. There is that Malachi chapter 4. Turning the heart of the children to the fathers, he turns them back to the covenant. Moses and Elijah are the only two that can come and turn Israel's heart to get them to recognize that the that the heart of the fathers was the covenant that God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when they missed it at the first time when John the Baptist came, forerun Moshiach, and he was turning the heart of the fathers to the children. He was taking and showing them that the covenant is here. 
And they missed it. Very few believed it then. But in the latter days, they recognized who Moshiach is. And Moses is one of those ones. I mean, people, come on. In closing, let me just say this. Wake up. Get off of these isms. You know, this nonsense about it's got to be Elijah and Enoch. They got to die. Well, then you, the way, more people that preach a rapture believe that it's Moses, or excuse me, Elijah and Enoch than anybody I know of. You know, I can understand the people that don't believe in a rapture saying something like that. Gosh, I give them credit. But people like Perry Stone and stuff that sit there and, and claim to believe a rapture and then turn around and say that Enoch's got to come because he's got to die. I mean, come on, wake up! Give me a scripture where God said Enoch would come back. I have proven to you by the word of Almighty God that God put His voice in Moses and He said that He would actually, that they would believe the voice of the latter sign. I've shown you by the word of God that it says in uh, Exodus the 15th chapter, Asherah Adonai Ga'ago'ol. You know, God, Moses sitting there saying, I will, I will sing. He's using a personal pronoun and does it in the future. I will sing that uh, uh, God has gotten victory over his horse and over his rider. One horse, one rider, the Antichrist spirit that comes into the world. And then what do we find? Elijah we have plainly. You have, you have it in Revelation. You have it there. We see on Mount Transfiguration, Jesus with, with three witnesses sees Moses and Elijah. So they're not dead. Of course, I know, I know you believe that, you know, but I mean, that should have, that should have been obvious to you. You know, and, and they're, they're, they're the two olive trees. For God's sake, you, you ever know, for those of you that have never been to Israel before, if you go to Israel and you go to the area where Jesus would pray across the Kidron Valley, where he'd resort to pray there, there's two olive trees there that have been dated by Jerusalem's university there by doing something with the roots, I don't know how they do this or whatever, but when they dated it, those, olive, those two olive trees are two, over 2,000 years old. You wonder where Jesus was doing his praying? And why is there two trees that are that age? You know, I believe that they're a type of Moses and Elijah. And of course, he met them there anyway. Not saying he met them in that particular spot, but you know what I'm saying. You know, the scripture is plain. And let me say this also in closing. One last thing I want to really point out to you. I've told you in the past, the covenant with the Vatican is one of your biggest signs that tribulation is at the door. Shimon Perez is on a diehard... How can I say it? He is, he's, he's determined to make a covenant with the Vatican. He started back in 1993, and he's not young. He's 89 years old, if I'm not mistaken. That's how old he is right now. But he's determined to get that covenant done. He is determined to fulfill what his calling is. And God swore that he would do this to Ahab's son. And Ahab married Jezebel, and Shimon Perez is marrying Jezebel, the spiritual side of Jezebel, that harlot of Revelation Chapter, uh, what is that? I forget in Revelation. And yet God warned our people, come out of her, my people. Be not partakers of her sins. And I know that you can apply that in Christianity as well. But let me tell you something. It applies to Israel more so. And we also have it in the Torah as well to come out of her. Jeremiah, it's in the Tanakh. When, when uh, the prophet Jeremiah, in chapter 50 to 51, he says, come out of her, my people. Just like it says in John in Revelation chapter uh, 18, verse 4, I believe it is. You know, why? Because Israel makes a covenant with them. But the 144,000, you don't see the 144,000, they're virgins. That doesn't mean it's a bunch of men going out and, and you guys got to get over that one as well. It means that they're not married in to any such nonsense. When Christ comes, they're a chaste virgin waiting upon him. That's what they're waiting for. Moses and Elijah bring them out of the, out of, out of the traditions that they're under, and they point them to, they take the children, and they point them to the heart of the Father. They turn the, heart, the children's to the heart of the fathers. 
They fulfilled that part of the verse that was not fulfilled before. Elijah does that. He points them back to the covenant that God had made. And Moses is there to be able to help do that. It is later than you realize. You have no idea. If God took, just remember what we talked about at the beginning, when Ahab married Jezebel, immediately Elijah comes on the scene and shuts the heavens that it rained not in the days of his ministry. You got it right there in Revelation 11. Their ministry, they closed up the heavens. They turned the waters to blood. Do you know what the tribulation is that's coming on the earth now? Everybody has got this crazy idea. Oh, it's going to be the Jews. They're going to be under tribulation. No, it's going to be the Gentile church. And I say the Gentile church, you know, there's a lot of people, they look at that scripture and they say, well, the church goes into tribulation. You know what? You're right. Most Christians, professing Christians, go into tribulation because they rejected Jesus, Yeshua, as being Mashiach to know who he really is. And they do go into tribulation. Maybe that's why it looks so confusing. You are right about that. The church does. But the bride of Jesus Christ, those that are called out, that have separated from all of these systems that are out there. And I'm not telling you to don't go to church. I'm just simply telling you that they've separated from the nonsense. That's his bride. And she doesn't go through tribulation. So when you want to think that the church goes into tribulation, I have to agree with you, a lot of them do. There's going to be so few that will be missing, it's not even going to be funny. No wonder why it says, what is it, Isaiah 57? They don't take it to heart. They just don't get it. Because such a small number go. God bless you. I pray this has helped you. Understand, I'm not playing church anymore. I don't have time for it. And I appreciate you so much. I love you so much. I want to see you ready. And I want to see you take this hour serious. And if you don't know, if you're Jewish and you don't know Yeshua, if you don't know him, if you're watching this and you're Jewish, there's many Jews I know that watch it. You don't know him as Mashiach, the only form of salvation that's coming to this world. You, you can call me. You can find my phone number. It's easy enough to find on the internet. But I'll do everything I can to help you. You can give your life to Him and Him save you. You don't have to have somebody pray through with you, but if you need somebody to pray through with you, I'll gladly pray through with you. All you got to do is write me and, and, and give me your phone number. I'll call you. I'll pray with you. Because my desire is to see as many people recognize Jesus Christ as Messiah if you're a Gentile and you don't know Him as your Savior, I encourage you with all my heart, this is the time to get your life in. And it's not just reciting some sinner's prayer. I, I, you know, I believe it's just, you, you know, you're, you're no further from God. If you're backslid, you're no further from God than what it takes for your knees to hit the ground and to repent and ask Him sincerely from your heart, forgive you. You don't have to have a bunch of fancy words or try to figure it all out. Just simply ask Him to forgive you and to save your soul, cry out with all your heart, like as if you were going to be dying the next morning. You, you know, if you were on death row and they're going to put you to death and you knew you needed to get to God and you needed to be saved, I think that's the way you should cry out to Him. And I just encourage you, you know, don't be playing around any longer. We don't have time, people. We don't have time. And I know when my people recognize who... Yeshua is. And that mourning begins to happen over there in Israel. You know, and, and the brother on uh, Facebook, uh, brother, I can't for the life of me see with all the promises. There's a book I wrote called Israel, They Still God's People. I would encourage you to get it and read it. And that book there, and I really didn't go into it as much in here as probably what I should have because it's kind of a different subject altogether. But I go into such depth of Israel and the promises. She's there in her homeland. I know it's confusing because truly, when they go to build the third temple they're going to do now, that's not God's doing. That's going to be Satan trying to put something up to get Israel to fall for it. So I know it looks confusing there, but you have to understand, he still has a remnant there, and he brought them home for the purpose of 
for, for forgiving them and forgiving their iniquities, as Daniel said. Yes, they are there. And yes, it is the hand of Almighty God that they're in that homeland. And before you speak against it, you need to really take serious consideration how dangerous that is. I'd, I'd send you the book for free if that's what, if you don't have the money and you need it, I'll send it to you. God knows at my heart, I want to help people is my desire. And there's people that, that are kind enough to give to this ministry that that just helps us to be able to do something like that. In fact, there's a brother that I promised him I'd send him one. I, and I'll tell you another thing. I wish Brother Tom up in the uh, Chicago area there, I believe he's up there around near Chicago, he had called me the other uh, earlier, was it yesterday? I believe it was. And, and we talked quite a bit about this very subject. I wish I could have recorded that conversation. Such an inspiring conversation we had together. God bless him. God bless his family. His son Joshua, I wish I knew his wife's name. Uh, but God bless all that family there. Anyway, God bless each and every one of you. And I'm glad that you uh, took the time to listen and uh, keep pressing the battle. Seeking, my gosh, brother, sister, pray. Get in his presence. Pray till you get into his presence. And when you get into his presence, worship him. Worship him and then ask what you will. God bless you. Baruch Amen.